<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the sec second lecture of the Williams Institute lecture series. Uh, this time with a conversation or lectures from our, our colleague, the Reverend, I mean, Dr. I'm sorry if I gave you a title. Dr. Juan Floyd Thomas, Associate Professor of African American Religious History at Vanderbilt Divinity School and Graduate Department of Religion. Uh, today's um, lecture, he will um, continue, continue the conversation we started last night. And if you missed last night, I certainly hope you'll go on the website when it's posted and catch it so that you get fully into this conversation. We'll follow the same um, way we did last night, which is we will receive questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. So if you put things in the chat, I'll miss it. But if you have a question at the end of the lecture, uh, put it in the Q&A. If you'd like to see the lecture being transcribed while it's being presented, you can click on the CC at the bottom of your screen now and invite it to show you the subtitles. The Williams Lecture Institute was instituted in 1981 in honor of, um, of um, Dr. Ronald Williams, who was the professor of theology from 71 to 81 at his death. And we featured a lot of speakers from many backgrounds, including theologians, ethicists, Christian uh, educators, poets, biblical scholars, historians, pastoral psychologists, and more. The list is long and notable, and I am glad that we're adding Dr. Juan to this long and notable list of scholars to lead us in our own work and vision of a world made new. As we, Sankofa, remember the past critically so that we can go for it in a just and right way. Dr. Juan, the floor is yours. I'm looking forward to what you will add to us today. Okay, I don't know if it's just me, but I can't hear Dr. Juan. Is it just me? Here we go. Uh, I hope I'm coming through loud and clear. Uh, once again, I'm so grateful and glad not only for that generous and kind introduction, but also for this invitation, this opportunity to be with you all virtually, if not physically at MTSO. I am truly honored and humbled to um, occupy this space as the Williams lecturer and to join in that, that great cloud of witnesses uh, some of us, some still here with us and others who have gone on to glory. And I don't take it lightly that this is a, a, a great opportunity to share in, in a discourse and dialogue with, with each and every one of you all. So please, as Dean Bridgman has uh, stated, um, bring questions and, and hopefully I, I can share what my understanding, my expertise, my experience has led me to best understand about uh, what we're dealing with here. In the shadow, the very long shadow of, of the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, what we have to grapple with, and uh, part of why I've named our, our time together right now, uh, Up From the Ashes, in addressing the ongoing lessons and legacy of, of that massacre, that, that heinous event, is because we must grapple as we move forward as a people, as a nation, as a church, as a world, as we move forward in the ways that we need to progress and proceed, right? We ought to learn lessons from history, right? That which happens to us and oftentimes through us should not be taken for granted or treated as simply a, a, a mystery or mistake of, of history. So to that point, what I'd like to, to, as briefly, but as, as thoroughly as possible, uh, discuss, you know, in our time this afternoon is a situation in which a few months ago, uh, in the advance of the centennial anniversary of 
of the Tulsa 1921 uh, massacre. Three of the survivors of, of that attack went to uh, Capitol Hill. Miss Viola Fletcher at the age of 107, her younger brother, Hugh's Uncle Red Van Ellis, who was 100 years old, and a third survivor, Miss Lessie Benningfield Randall, who was 106. They, they proceeded to appear before a House subcommittee that was seeking to advance the cause of reparations for the Tulsa massacre. And also, as we can imagine, lay the groundwork for a larger discussion of African-American reparations in this nation, often uh, um, consolidated in the form of, of HR Bill uh, 40. Now, Ms. Fletcher was just, or just had turned seven years old when one branch of the angry white mob that descended upon uh, um, Greenwood, as I discussed on yesterday evening, right? When they came running through their neighborhoods, through, you know, attacking black folks at, in this wanton rage with murderous intent, as she so, as she, uh, so eloquently and, and uh, um, poignantly told the assembled members of Congress on that subcommittee, she said, I'm a survivor of the Tulsa race massacre. Two weeks ago, at this point in time, it would have been in uh, May, I celebrated my 107th birthday. Today, I'm visiting Washington, D.C. for the first time in my life. I'm here seeking justice and asking my country to acknowledge what happened in Tulsa in 1921. Now, please keep in mind, they were there as, as a representative delegation on behalf of a lawsuit seeking reparations, not only from the city of Tulsa and Tulsa County and the Tulsa Chamber of Commerce, but also the state of Oklahoma. The, the lawsuit that they are a part of argues that Oklahoma and, and specifically Tulsa were responsible for what happened that fatal and fateful day during the massacre in which many scholars, historians, and, and others have estimated that upwards of 300 black people were murdered that day, more than 10,000 left homeless and displaced, and the entirety of the all black community of Greenwood had been destroyed and yet to be rebuilt to its, its former glory. Now, the reason I bring this up for, for our discussion and, and uh, consideration today is that I firmly and squarely believe, as I stated on yesterday evening, that the Tulsa race massacre occurred and needs to be contextualized within a broader uh, context of, of white supremacist violence, and, and oppression in this nation that yes, stems from, emerges and evolves from chattel slavery, but also within the, the manifestation of Jim and Jane Crow segregation included structures of, of permission structures as well as a, a broader conspiracy of, of silence and invisibility that allowed for lynching to take place that allowed for these, these violent episodes such as the Tulsa massacre to not be singular and, and uh, strange occurrences, but actually woven into the broader fabric, the broader history of, of our nation. And then last, but certainly not least, also embedded within many uh, um, social policies, social praxis, and there I even argue as, as uh, um, we will uh, move forward, even woven into the theological and ethical frameworks of our, our nation and our world. So in grappling with the issues of the conspiracy of silence, right? the, the idea, the, the reckoning that even contemporaneous to the massacre's occurrence, there were active efforts, I, I, I'll call them out by name, there are active efforts by the NAACP under the leadership of, of uh, James Weldon Johnson, 
he issued a report, he and the organization issued a report called the 1921 Tulsa race riot, the language used at the time, in which they documented many of the attestations of the, of the, the victims and the survivors of the massacre at the time. We would also have, as I made note on yesterday evening, in 2001, State Representative uh, for Oklahoma, uh, uh, Don Ross was part of a commission that looked at the, the 1921 massacre, right? In 2005, there was a case that made its way up to the US Supreme Court, also seeking reparations for the then surviving victims of uh, the Tulsa massacre, and that appeal was denied. That 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 uh, request that that lawsuit was overturned, which is why now, with these three survivors pressing their way and finding the the courage to not only challenge but change this nation and and change its its uh, point of view in terms of what is true justice in this world. What is possible for those folks who've suffered egregious and, and grievous uh, um, hurt and harm in this world? In hearing Ms. Fletcher and, and her fellow plaintiff's uh, um, testimony, Georgia Representative Hank Johnson said that the Tulsa Greenwood Massacre Claims Accountability Act, the, the piece of legislation that was uh, um, under consideration by the Congress at that time would ultimately provide survivors and descendants access to the courts in order to seek restitution for what clearly has been one of the most heinous and worst episodes of racial violence in this nation's history. In the past, as, as uh, Representative Johnson said, survivors and descendants of, of many of these atrocities have had their claims rejected because of statute of limitations restrictions. So we need to think about this as, as Representative Johnson says, the victims of this atrocity have been denied justice far too long. But the idea that somehow that there might be an expiration date on people's tragedy, trauma and pain that somehow according to our system of, and I'm, I'm being delicate here in, in framing it as um, jurisprudence, right? Criminal justice operates in such a way in which after a point in time, as, after a, a set date on a calendar, supposedly those folks who have been wounded or, or abused, neglected, mistreated, somehow their, their pain, suffering, and woe is no longer relevant or no longer needs remedy or repair. Once again, I revisit the words of Ms. Fletcher, as she says that I will never forget the violence of the white mob when they left our home. I still see black men being shot, black bodies laying in, lying in the street. I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying over here, head. I still hear the screams. This was her making that statement, that testimony at the, at the age of 107 years young. In reaction and response to that, once again, Georgia Representative uh, Hank Johnson says that for those folks who, who suffered and, and survived the massacre, their lives, their land, and their liberty were stolen from them. And then these victims were erased from our national history. This massacre, undoubtedly had a devastating toll on the Black community in Tulsa, but creating a cause for action to recover compensation for these wrongs is just one step in our path towards healing. I would later, I would say going further that Johnson would later say that there is substantial evidence that shows government officials, including the police and the National Guard, were complicit in the massacre 100 years ago. And that is where I would like to turn our attention right now, because in recent days, weeks, and months, 
there's been much uh, contestation, much questioning, much challenging around a concept that has uh, existed for quite some time, especially in the confines of, of law schools and graduate schools, a concept known as critical race theory. And to echo words that I think were, were both apt and true by uh, Dean uh, Valerie Bridgman on last night, what many folks in, in various corners of our, our culture and society are complaining about in terms of critical race theory is in point of fact, a more accurate and precise rendering and, and revisiting of American history. When we have intentional deletions, erasures, silences, and, and uh, um, omissions of the factual record of what has actually happened in the lives of individuals and communities in this nation, especially those who are BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color in this nation, folks who are female or, or LGBTQ individuals, folks who have been poor and dis, disenfranchised, disinherited, dispossessed in, in this world, right? The idea that to correct the record, to offer an assessment or, or a system of analysis that would question the status quo or question the, the ability of the powerful to remain in power, that is seen as the problem rather than what those powerful people have done with their power being questioned or, or somehow um, generating cause for alarm. In my theological purview, I've always been of the mind that the gospel, and you know, I take much of this from my, my embrace and appreciation of, of liberation theologies, of womanist theologies. The notion was that the truth of the gospel, the power of the gospel was to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable rather than to allow for the, the lopsided and unjust power dynamics of this world to persist and, and be sustained as, as if nothing was wrong. Why I'm, I'm discussing and describing this is through the prism of talking about the Tulsa massacre and setting it in this context, although it, it happened a hundred years ago, what I fear and, and worry about is we've not in any way, shape, or form as a people, as a nation, as a church, as a world, addressed any of the sources of this problematic disposition, of this problematic and, and uh, pernicious problem of white supremacy and growing tolerance, toleration, as it were, for oppression, marginalization, violence, and neglect in our culture, in our society. So rather than running from notions such as critical race theory, I'm actually working on a project. It evolved and emerged out of my uh, study of race and racism, religion and uh, violence to now concentrate more, more keenly on a notion that I, I've called critical race theology, that once again, it is built upon and, and borrows heavily from Black liberation theology, womanist theologies, but also merges and marries it with the works of, of critical race theorists, folks who in the realm of law, history, sociology, and other academic discourses are taking seriously the ways in which not just our, our politics or our cultural practices have been warped and corrupted by white supremacy and other forms of oppression, but even those things that are most integral and dare I say sacred to us in terms of how we appreciate or in, in some cases appropriate scripture, how we form our, our theological and, and ethical worldviews, 
how we preach, teach, and do ministerial or missionary outreach, all of this has been configured and, and given life and shape within a cauldron made possible by white supremacy and empire. And that needs to be called out. But also those folks who either by their biological descendancy or behavioral dependencies on white supremacy, on oppression, on empire, must also not just be called out, but also called into accountability, called into a notion of responsibility, called into what some folks would, would dare regard um, common decency and even, dare I say, common sense about how the current state of the world and our condition and, and situation within it does not permit or can no longer sustain an unfettered and unreflective use of power and privilege for some against the needs and the existential uh, concerns of the multitude. So to this point, and I just want to um, raise up at least three, three key concerns, three points very quickly um, before opening the floor for a uh, much necessary uh, conversation and, and dialogical exchange. First, Even within the, the, the gaps, the, the lapses in many folks' educational uh, um, awareness or, or uh, experiential understanding of the events, the causes leading up to the Tulsa massacre, but also the consequences in the aftermath of, of the massacre. One of the things that I believe is most earnest and, and urgent for us to give consideration to is the fact that I, more often than not, for even those folks who have been uh, um, aware of the heinous activities that happened during that 24-hour period from May 31st to June 1st in 1921, more often than not, I think uh, an um, overabundance of of uh, attention and uh, um, concern has been attached to the fact that this massacre took place in a, in a space, in a community that had been dubbed Black Wall Street. If we just take a moment of pause and look at how, to the extent where by, by naming the community thus, right? And, you know, as I, I uh, offered on yesterday evening, the fact that that, um, that nickname, that, that loving title had been bestowed upon the community by um, Booker T. Washington, um, who in his own capacity and contribution to African-American history was a firm believer that it was gonna be economic success and, and, and that measure of black excellence rather than uh, protest, rather than uh, um, agitation, right? The model that, uh, um, his oftentimes uh, rival or, or uh, ideological uh, counter, counterpoint, uh, W.B. Du Bois was advan advancing during uh, that era of the early 20th century, that it was going to be, in, in Washington's mind, it was going to be the level of monetary or, or financial success that the Black community attained that would safeguard and, and, and provide uh, security and, and stability and status for America, especially in the eyes of, of our white brothers and sisters in the nation. So I find it fascinating from that point of view. And you know, we can run this through a, a critical race uh, theological perspective, wherein in contemporary terms, if all you're chasing after is the fulfillment of, of a prosperity gospel in which God is nothing more than you know, a, a, you know, a cosmic vision of an ATM and, and Jesus is nothing more than you know, your, your concierge, right? You know, the person who's 
anointed and appointed to go fetch you this and fetch you that because you want to blab it and grab it. You want to name it and claim it. But in no way, shape, or form are you, either as an individual, as a congregation, as a broader uh, church family of faith, and ultimately as a society, as part of, of God's creation in the world, at no point are you trying to take up challenge and, and take up any of the means at your disposal, whether it be your, vo your voice or your vote, to try to challenge and change these, these wicked and unjust systems in the world. When we wrestle with and, and try to um, simply put our head down and say that, okay, if I keep my nose to the grindstone, if I build a better business, if I, if I build up my 401k, if I, if I you know, stack enough uh, um, dollars in the bank account, or if I, you know, if I jump into uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency, right, that'll show all those folks who want to treat me as a second class subordinate uh, uh, subhuman individual, that'll show them, that'll prove to them that I matter. But as we witnessed 100 years ago, and unfortunately, even as we still in this day and time in, in the year 2021 have to grapple with, what happens when no matter what your bank account says, when, what happens when no, no matter of, of material success or, or, or um, economic influence and impact safeguards you? from the violent vicissitudes of white supremacy, right? That is a question that we sincerely and desperately need to ask ourselves. Second point I'd like to at least advance for our consideration and conversation. And I was, I was grateful when, uh, after uh, um, my remarks yesterday, uh, Dean Bridgman and I had a chance to, to um, share. And the Dean had brought up the quite obvious fact of what happens when we look at Tulsa and understand that as much as what we oftentimes will, will discuss and describe in binary terms as far as a, a black white conflict, right? Was also happening on the lands of, of indigenous people that had been stolen and expropriated, right? The idea that even to this day, if you, if you happen to make uh, trips into or around uh, Oklahoma, you'll oftentimes see signage that claims that it is Native America. And yet, outside of, of maybe occasional, uh, if you intentionally make trips either to a casino or to a reservation, you'd be hard pressed to see actual native peoples able to, to enjoy and fully uh, um, experience and, and enjoy the land of their ancestors. Right? I say this because, and this is something that I come to once again through this prism of critical race theology, wherein as much as I am someone who embrace and, and extol uh, Black liberation theology, and especially its rootedness in the notions of, of the Exodus motif. And for some of you all, um, this might be uh, new knowledge, but embedded within much of, of the Black Christian tradition is the, the framework of, of understanding the Black experience through the prism of the exilic experience of of the children of Israel as they found themselves in captivity in Egypt, right? So the juxtaposition of, of Moses and the Israelites versus Pharaoh and Pharaoh's army. And then embedded within that is the Exodus, right? The, the, the escape plan, if you will, that, that is executed by Moses and, and the children of Israel to the land of promise, right, Canaan. Now, within the, the narrative and the normativity of the Black Christian tradition, that, that 
that's the teleology, right? The trajectory of that story is such where, oh, well, the, the, the children of Israel, the Israelites, the enslaved have been persecuted and punished and, and suffered. They escape, they go into the land of promise and they're able to claim it. But what I have learned and understand and, and, and take to heart from especially Native American uh, theologians, I think here about Vine Deloria Jr. I think about uh, George Tink Tinker. I think about Andrea Smith and, and others who talk about the fact that, well, you, we can't, from the point of view of, of our Native brothers and sisters, right, they can't see the story the same way, right? They can't grapple with that narrative, that motif the same way because they envision themselves in the place of the Canaanites, right? That for the, the Israelites to come into the land of promise and act as if, operate as if the, the Canaanites, the folks who were indigenous inhabitants of the land were just inconvenient uh, um, obstacles to be brushed aside so that you, we could claim a, a greater promise. Fast forward, to our, our yet to be United States, to borrow the term from uh, the beloved poet uh, Maya Angelou. Right. I lift up from uh, the work of uh, um, Reverend Dr. Gerilyn uh, Uhlenberg in, in her wonderful book, A Lynch Black Wall Street, where she talks about early on in, in terms of black indigenous relations, you would often have um, black missionaries, you know, Baptist churches and, and the like that would set up um, church plants among Native American peoples and that it would be black missionaries who would become the direct intercessors and, and uh, um, interpreters of the gospel for Natives brothers and sisters as, as they were oftentimes converting to Christianity, sometimes by choice, often other times by force or, or compulsion, let's put it that way. But equally powerful in that, that tension is also a history in which, for some of us this may be uh, um, familiar, but for others this may be new, that as the United States made its westward expansion, especially in the, the mid to late um, 1800s, right? The use of, of black soldiers, often referred to as Buffalo soldiers, were the, the, the um, vanguard. They were oftentimes the, the first interaction that many native peoples had with the US military and, and the broader scope of the US empire as it was moving across the, the trans Mississippi West. So what we have to grapple with there is a twofold history, whether we talk about it in missionary terms or military terms, in which two, I think, equally and, and uh, um, co comparably oppressed groups in this nation are pitted against each other. Once again, in this missionary outreach, as well as this military, uh, this vision of military conquest, and now having to rework and rewrite a history together through this shared prism, through this shared lens of, of a larger scheme of white supremacy and oppression that troubles us all, that is a plague to all of us. What I'm suggesting and hoping, as, as uh, we will discuss, a critical race theology is necessary to face that challenge of how do folks who have equally and and uh, um, but equally yet separately been um, oppressed, marginalized, scapegoated, brutalized, and even murdered, how do we find common ground as a way forward? Third and finally, as, uh, as I'd like us for, uh, for our consideration to lift up, 
we are in strange times, my friends. I, I, I hopefully uh, I'm not alone in thinking or, or feeling this. But I grapple with the, the idea that even as we've seen so much righteous indignation and fake uh, um, fabricated outrage arising from uh, political conservatives and even evangelical Christians over how unpatriotic and anti-American the mere suggestion of questioning past grievances or, or, or atrocities of which I, I put high on the list, the 1921 uh, uh, Tulsa massacre is within our public life and trying to reconnect that broken chain of memory within our, our consciousness as a people and a nation, there's little to no effort as I see it from those self-same governmental and ecclesial leaders to actually address the inordinate level of real world death, damage and devastation that has been done and perpetuated in America's name, in our name, by allowing white supremacy to remain un unexamined and unhindered. So if you, if you indulge me by this logic, we can actually, as of, of uh, recent months and years, we can actually have a commemoration of the 1619 event in Jamestown, where the arrival of, as, as is quoted, some 20 odd Negroes established a, a, a history, a trajectory of what has been uh, claimed by many as original, America's original sin. We can have, in the wake of uh, the Black Lives Matters protests of uh, summer of last year, a final federal recognition of the Juneteenth holiday. Here in Nashville, a place that I'm, I'm proud to call home, we can have streets named after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, even the late great Congressman uh, John Lewis. Right, you could go from coast to coast and find institutions, schools, and, and community centers named after some of the greatest figures in Black life and politics, culture, and faith. And yet, according to the, the edicts and the behaviors of some of these uh, um, brothers and sisters on the far right, if any of us were to ask questions about, well, why did Rosa Parks or, or John Lewis take uh, social action against uh, Jim and Jane Crow segregation? What's the big deal about Juneteenth and why does it matter? If a kindergartner or a high school student has the, the audacity to challenge the notion that slavery was a moral evil and a stain in, in this nation's history or doesn't try to uh, accommodate as was the case recently in uh, a North Texas school district wherein a, a school official said that in presenting the Holocaust in, in uh, textbooks or in teaching curriculum, folks should allow for both sides of, of the Holocaust to be offered up for consideration to the, the students in a classroom. The notion that if you ask those questions in a crucial fashion, as well as a critical mode of engagement, in some places that would be deemed not just uh, unlawful, but also immoral. My challenge to, to all of us, including myself, is the notion that if we are to move forward in the world with the, the purpose and intention that God has imbued within and upon us, as God gives us to see the right and to do the right, we need to challenge and question not only the, the history that we have re received, the the historical narratives and notions that we've inherited, but also challenge and change the history that we are destined to make in this world, right? Because I do believe uh, from the source of, of my being 
that we have been created and called by our God to do a mighty work in this world and to that great cloud of witnesses that we are indebted to, but also will be held accountable to when we are called back home. We need to guarantee that we are making the world not just possible, but livable for us, for those we, we, who are nearest and dearest to us, and even for those who we've not yet met and may never see on this side of, of glory. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention, and I welcome any and all questions. Dr. <clears throat> Floyd Thomas, thank you again for some challenging, um, for challenging us to think theologically, and I think in some ways anthropologically, about how we think about um, these massacres that have taken place in in U.S. history, for which certain people would uh, would like for us to forget. Last mm -hmm. night, when you were talking, you 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 said that, and you said it again today, that this is a larger uh, group of killings. We talked about this, like the long red summer, and you suggested it could go back to the fall, the Colfax massacre back in Louisiana, I think 1870s, mm -hmm. early 70s. And so, you know, I, I was like, and then there was Rosewood, and then there was El Elaine, Arkansas, where hundreds of Black people, because they had obtained wealth primarily, Mm -hmm. were massacred mm -hmm. and often um, for the same reason that uh, under the pretense that you have given to this massacre, which is the, the um, some white woman was attacked. Mm -hmm. She was not, mm -hmm. but some white woman was attacked. Mm -hmm. So I, I, yeah, I, I'm going to invite people that if you have questions to put it in the Q&A. And I'm going to pay homage to and make note of the fact that uh, Dr. Uhlenberg was with us. Uh, Geraldine Uhlenberg is with us, as is Reverend Dr. Papa Jeremiah Wright. So I want to uh, make a note of them. Mm -hmm. I would like for you to, I personally would like for you to say more about you know, you were saying people don't want to talk about the why of these things happening, but I would like for you to say more about the why and the way, because I'm thinking in 1906 in one of the biggest evangelical outbreaks of religious fervor, there was a massacre mm -hmm. in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So can you say more about how these two things live together, religious fervor and the massacre of both Native Americans and Black people, particularly Black free people? Oh, and I thank you for the question. And part of what I grapple with here, I'll at least um, approach it in a twofold fashion. First, within a culture and a society that, that condones all behavior of, of whiteness as, as good and virtuous and any behavior by people of color as, as contemptible or, or condemnable, worthy of contempt or, or condemnation, right? This idea then that, yes, you can have, you know, this, uh, you know, you know, you can have this Pentecostal fervor, you can have, you know, you know, this kind of exuberant and ecstatic expression of, of religiosity. And yet at the same time, yet and still, also, um, you know, hold uh, BIPOC lives, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color's lives as, as un unfit for, for living, unworthy of, of concern or consideration, right? If you construct a, a theology and a worldview that, that allows both of those things to, to operate side by side, right, you have the, the writing that, uh, of history as we've known it. Right. So the idea then that, you know, I, I'll just throw, throw this out for, for consideration. Um, the, the theologian uh, Reinhold Niebuhr famously wrote a work about, you know, the children of light and the children of darkness. 
And, you know, obviously he's borrowing language from, from Paul, which, you know, in and of itself speaks volumes in terms of a, a kind of juxtaposition of we, the children of light, we live this way. And they who are the children of dark, they, you know, darkness, they live that way, right? Built into the fabric of the faith is this kind of racial and I would dare argue racist bifurcation that if you're going to be virtuous, if you're going to be validated, if you're going to be vindicated, you must be nearer to, it's not nearer to God, to thee, but nearer to whiteness, right? Right, that you've got to gravitate that way. And that if, because your, your, your skin was kissed by, by nature's son and you were born with, with a heavenly, ebony or, or, or a bronze hue, that somehow you are a child of a lesser God, right? The, the the ways in which that is framed within so many so many parts of our theological worldview right when and I get into debates about this all the time um, within you know uh, the Eucharistic dimension of our of our uh, um, Christian traditions when you have what uh, we can affectionately refer to as the blood songs right and you know, we talk about from Emmanuel's vein flows blood that, you know, when I'm, I'm immersed in it, I will become white as snow, right? I mean, so there are ways in which the very um, theological nature and thought processes that we attach to the faith uh, uh, accommodate racial hierarchy, but also accept and condone that, right, we can exterminate or, or treat with extreme prejudice those who are other, capital O, other, right? So as I was suggesting before, with, with the issues of, of uh, the expansion of, of American imperialism, especially across the, the frontier West, and white government, white businesses, white citizens who didn't want to get their hands dirty, with, with the blood of, of Native peoples, right? In no other capacity, you know, as we discussed on yesterday evening, in terms of a Black armed self-defense, right? White folks didn't want to see Negroes with guns at any other time. But if in service of a nation that wants to impose its will, manifest destiny, as, as it's been uh, enshrined in many of our history textbooks, right? wanted to impose its, its collective will upon occupied lands, right? It would use Black people to either um, to uh, evict or exterminate red people, right? And all of that under the, the covering of the will of God, right? Because God wanted it and willed it so. So there's that part of this. I would also there say that what we're, we're, we're grappling with is when you have certain issues, certain crimes that, that boggle the mind, and, you know, it's kind of like, and I'll, 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 um, I'll be quick about this, it, it's sort of uh, the, the kind of psychological mind game that, that many of us have to engage in when you sit in an airplane, right? The notion that this big, heavy steel, you know, craft, that, that is carrying people, machinery, luggage, fuel, right, like all this stuff, that somehow it can proceed in a fashion lighter than air and get me from point A to point B and successfully land, right? You know, we don't get bragging rights for, for any plane that crashes. It's only the, the, the safe and proper landing that, that uh, gets applause. In a similar fashion, <laughs> to think about these kind of hateful and heinous events happening at such a magnitude, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people systematically being and intentionally being murdered, taken from human existence, and then magically erasing that so that nobody's the wiser, that, you know, generations of people could be born, live, and die not knowing the truth of, of the situation, right? I'm grateful and, and glad that, uh, um, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright is, is present because um, when he came uh, to Nashville to visit uh, um, some years ago, he had offered up in, in his remarks the notion that, and it, it stuck with me even to this day, 
the idea that when the, the massacre occurred at Mother Emanuel AME Church in, in um, Charleston, and, and we talked about this briefly uh, yesterday evening, the rush to forgive Dylan Roof, the, you know, folks are tripping over themselves to try and make sure that, that you know, this white supremacist, this, this person who was trying to literally incite race war, right? This, this murderer. Murder, yeah, murderer. He, he walked into the church and with the presence of right mind, knew that despite the kindness, generosity, Christian charity that had been shown and extended to him, he himself had said, I was almost persuaded not to, right? Echoing once again, Paul, right? So once again, you know, my many uh, um, deep and, and uh, um, troubling thoughts about Paul, you know, uh, bubble up. But, you know, I was almost persuaded not to, not to do this, but he still did it. Right? He defaulted to his worst rather than his better, his kinder angels. But uh, what Dr. Jeremiah Wright was talking about was, but as a nation, the United States, for instance, in response to the terrorist attacks on September 11th, right, acted in the most vindictive and vengeful fashion. And then as we've recently seen in, in what became the end of, of uh, our nation's forever war in Afghanistan, we supposedly went into Afghanistan to remake it, rebuild it, right? To, to bring hope, peace, justice, equality, all the things that we're still struggling for here at home. But supposedly we're going to export that to uh, the people of Kabul, right? We, you know, we're still looking for a slice of that here. Unfortunately, sadly, with the American departure, the Taliban is able to return to power as if they never left. In fact, they, they've now been validated they've been given a stamp of approval right now it's been seen oh well we yeah. tried okay yeah yeah but the idea that this nation in its collective uh, um kind of consideration right when when it was faced with what to do with the pain and the trauma of of lives that were innocent and lost far way too soon under under uh, circumstances that are way uh, um, intolerable, right? It reacted with the notion that might makes right. So I, I'm, yeah, what you, what you made me think of, and then I have a question from, from those listening, is I grew up in the Deep South. I grew up in Alabama, and I heard often mm -hmm. from my classmates, young people, mm -hmm. who I'm sure heard it from their parents, mm -hmm. save your Dixie cups, the South shall rise again. Mm -hmm. At the same time, and they were playing war games where Again, mm -hmm. you never play a union soldier. You always play uh, an aggrieved, yeah, yeah, yeah. an aggrieved um, uh, Confederate from the Northern aggression, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, saying to black people, "Get over it." Mm -hmm. So you all should get over it. Mm -hmm. But they were rehearsing and continuing to rehearse their grievances even now, mm -hmm. um, which I I think is a peculiar part. Of the of the and I mean white in the way you described it last night, white psyche. So John Reinhardt Hart asked this question. We've been exploring the impact of racial ideology on the minds, imagination, behavior of blacks, but not whites. Mm -hmm. How has racial ideology affected the mind, imagination, and behavior of whites? What does it mean that whites have the hardened heart of Pharaoh? Uh, and I would say, and also the 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 fragility of, oh, you're going to make me feel uncomfortable. It, both of those things live in the same space. We, we have about 15 more minutes, so I'm listening to you on this one. You no, no it? problem. No, and I thank you. And I thank uh, the questioner for um, that, that query. And I'll, I'll, I'll say one phrase, and hopefully it'll resonate. January 6, 2021. Why I say that as, as um, my, my case in point here is the idea that first, I, like many, many other folks, I was, you know, because of the nature of, of COVID and still trying to honor and obey the fact that, you know, the pandemic is real. You know, I, I am not one of these people who suffer under the delusion that I can punch a virus or that, you know, <laughs> I can wave a picket sign and make make germs go away. I, you know, I'm not one of these people. 
so I was at home with, with uh, my wife and, you know, we were looking at the news, you know, because so much, uh, um, so much had been, been expressed about uh, what would happen that day, January 6th with the ratification of the election, right? I'm a, I'm a politics nerd anyway. So, you know, I, I'm more often than not always watching MSNBC, never ESPN. So, you know, just, you know, charge it to the game, but but the idea that in the middle of the day, on, on, on that fateful day, witnessing what was unfolding and the fact that many of the folks who invaded, who participated in the insurrection, right? Let's use the words that, that uh, validly indict and indicate what happened that day, right? They could move with all entitlement, with every intention of overturning the work and the wishes of millions of, of their fellow Americans, right? There had been a free and fair election, even under the constraints and confines of the pandemic and all kinds of political shenanigans and, you know, all, all the kind of debates and, and disillusionment. People pressed their way, right? You on, you know, doing your one wonderful womanist work on yesterday, you, you know, I'm sorry to, to um, call you out like this, Dean Bridgman, but but you were participating in that great work of democracy as as a as you know someone helping folks to engage that most sacred of, of acts. What uh, are yeah, dealing for those who don't know, I was an election official in our local uh, elections yesterday. Right, and you know, uh, you know, once again, calling on uh, our our dearly departed brother uh, John Lewis, he said the most powerful uh, weapon of nonviolence is our ballot, is a vote. Right. So, when things just don't go the way that the 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 MAGA crowd wished and hoped that it would, right? They believed that they were fully empowered and entitled to overturn it, right? When the man on whose behalf they had organized and rallied themselves and were willing to actually implement murderous violence didn't accompany them, right? You know, he promised he was going to march with them, but like many of the promises Donald Trump made, he quickly broke it and went the other way. You had folks walking through the halls of, of Congress, literally desecrating and defecating in, in these hallowed halls. You know, we were just talking about the, the religion of the lost cause, right? The notion that you, you had photographic evidence of an individual walking through the halls of Congress, waving proudly and, and loudly the stars and bars, a, a feat that had never been accomplished at the height of the Civil War, right? And yet, here we are now, months removed from the event, and we have folks in Congress, but also in, in many churches across the nation who would ask us to let bygones be bygones, who would dare challenge us to just throw this into a memory hole, a deep, dark uh, um, space and never, never utter it again, who would want us to believe because it's inconvenient and, and uncomfortable that, well, what you saw, you didn't see. Right. right. I, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you because ultimately what you're saying is what you've been saying, which is that, I, you know, I basically people who know themselves as white and who embrace a certain kind of whiteness need to repent and repent as in 180 degree turn. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean get you some black friends. I mean, I mean, literally denounce the demonic notion of white supremacists. Um, theory, theology, anthropology, the whole nine yards. Um, uh, and if I could just interject quickly, I agree 100% with what you just said, Madam Dean, but let's go one step further. Too many of our, of our br brothers and sisters who identify themselves as white oftentimes make the default argument, well, that wasn't me. I right. didn't own enslaved folk or I wasn't the ones who hung, you know, whites only signs on establishments or, or enforced Jim and Jane Crow segregation. Okay, you may not be able to rectify or, or repair what happened then, but this is happening on our watch, your yeah, watch. Exactly. Right, where you stand in this moment, right? Uh, and I'll quote Dr. King here, right? Right, we don't 
judge our friends by where they stand in moments of, of comfort and convenience. We have to judge and evaluate our friends on times of crisis and controversy, right? Are you down with me when it's not convenient or comfortable to be down with me? Right. Right? When we talk about allyship and things like that. Yeah, sort. I hate the word ally because because ally is a military term that says I benefit from it and therefore I can come in and out as I want to. I prefer co-conspirators and people <laughs> who see their lives bound up in the freedom of my life. I have a question from uh, Reverend Dr. Papa Jeremiah Wright, uh, which is, does your critical race theology deal with or engage the doctrine of discovery? And you might want to briefly describe what the doctrine of discovery is for those people who don't know. Well, the way I grapple with the doctrine of discovery can uh, um, operate in a twofold fashion, both in terms of when we're thinking about what the notion of, of race and racism is, when, when we're thinking about how to engage in the world in such a way where the superiority of some folks has to be uh, um, grounded in, you know, a, a kind of notion of birth and, and blood and soil, right? You know, white supremacists have had their, their kind of functional notion of this for, for generations. You know, if, if folks hearken back to the, the notion of um, 2017 and uh, um, the Charlottesville uh, um, protest rally, right? You know, which uh, twice impeached former and president- murder. Right, and murder, the murder of Heather Heyer, right? The, the idea that the Unite the Right rally was premised upon not just uh, um, combating and confronting folks who wanted to rename a park, Emancipation Park, you know, take down Confederate uh, memorabilia and monuments and suggest that liberty, liberation was, was something that was worthy of celebration. But as many of those, those folks with tiki torches and khaki, uh, khaki pants and polo shirts were marching through the streets, they were saying Jews will not replace us, right? You know, making these, uh, you know, fascistic and Nazi chants of, of blood and soil. Right, this notion that you have a blood and a birthright to uh, um, everything that the land has to offer. And that, you know, even in a nation of immigrants, even in a nation of, of people who should extol and embrace the fact that we, you know, e, plur, e pluribus unum, right, out of many one. But what's become interesting about even that, that the evoking of that Latin phrase is that yes, out of many one, but still um, grappling with it in terms of hierarchy, in terms of power relations and dynamics, saying that, yeah, out of many one, but you know, we're the, the white one is the right one, right? You know, that kind of logic or, or illogic as it were. Critical race theology as, as I'm trying to configure it and, and construct it, operates in a way in which we have to challenge those, those preconceived notions, those grapple with those renditions of, of how in our, our scriptural interpretations, our homiletical hermeneutics, our ethical frameworks. I mean, we have to strip this thing all the way down to rebuild it, to remake it, right? Into what I believe, you know, and once again, I, I hark, hearken back to uh, James Cone, right? If we believe that freedom, liberation, justice and equality is, is the basis, it's the backbone of the gospel, right? All, all the, um, I know that we're being recorded, so I'll use uh, um, PG uh, um, words, right? All the stuff that's been accumulated on top of what the gospel was always meant and intended to be has to be stripped away has to be, right? And sometimes you can use a Brillo pad. Sometimes you have to use acid, you know, sulfuric acid to strip it away. But we got to strip away, as uh, um, Daddy J says, right, this doctrine of discovery that says that, you know, somehow it's within the will of God for me to dictate and dominate other human beings. Anybody that's not already Christian, <laughs> you know, giving themselves the, and then having to do all of the kind of the flips 
in the air to justify, quote, Christianizing non-white people and holding them either as slaves or dispossessing them of their land and their culture. Mm -hmm. The doctrine of the, speaking of demon, doctors of demons, there's one <laughs> from, from the 15th, uh, 15th century, there's one that, mm -hmm. that I do think keeps, um, it just keeps reverberating in the way that, certainly in the way I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I, I think about uh, Reverend Dapney, who was the Presbyterian minister who wrote the theology for, for the, the slavery and mm -hmm. gave the Confederate states kind of the theological framework mm -hmm. for, the, for their war against uh, the Union. Mm -hmm and for their theological understanding of why slavery was okay, you know, using scripture. I, th I think some of the challenge is that we are, we are unwilling to be critical about our thinking about scripture, our thinking about anthropology, of, you know, listening to, to um, a uh, um, podcast the other day around where these divisions of humans came from, red and yellow, black and white, all of that a part of the racist uh, demarcation of real humans, you know, so whether or not Black people were subhumans or, di or different kinds of humans. I, I just, I, I think the Tulsa massacre with the Kofax, with the other ones that we know of, and these are the ones we talk about, right? The Rosewood one in Florida, because they were so... Um, you, they couldn't, despite trying to cut them out of the paper, they mm -hmm. couldn't, couldn't erase it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess I, I, I guess I'm making more of a statement than asking a question. I do wonder how the church needs to respond. And by church here, I really mean the church. I mean whether they see themselves as predominantly black or they are in a predominantly white congregation or they're in a deliberately or, de or decidedly multi-racial congregation. What, given what you've shared these two days, what, what are some of the responses here? I thank you for that question. And maybe that's the, um, the purpose for the entirety of our, our conversation over these last two days. Um, I hearken back to an essay um, to, to call once again into this, this space, another uh, person who's uh, gone on to join the ancestors. I think about uh, um, our dear uh, colleague and, and uh, co-conspirator, uh, Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon. Uh, it, it, you can find this uh, chapter in uh, um, Katie's Canon, but it, you know, it's also available elsewhere in, in journal uh, form. But she makes an argument about slavery and Christianity and towards the tail end of, of, of that piece, she talks about the, the complicity of the, the church, especially and particularly the white church um, um, in the slaveholding South as part of the slaveocracy, right? The church, the price of the ticket that the church had to um, pay in order to not only exist, but flourish. The reason why we have so many of these denominations that loudly and proudly proclaim themselves as Southern Baptist or Southern Methodist or Southern Presbyterian, right? right. The, unfortunately, sadly, every time you know, that uh, Southern was attached to many of these uh, um, church denominations, right? that meant that they were on the wrong side of human history, right? that they were loudly and, and you know, just recently in Nashville, uh, earlier uh, this year, right, you know, the Southern Baptists try to, you know, keep an unbroken record. <laughs> okay, right. By accepting, embracing, and acknowledging something that would clearly be indicated as, as a great moral evil, the buying, selling, exploitation, and, and torturing of, of fellow human beings for profit, aka chattel slavery, the idea that, um, uh, Dr. Cannon was was trying to expound on is the church writ large, but especially uh, white brothers and sisters who who call themselves Christian had to operate under this kind of paradox, 
right? If you're going to exist and, and you know, build your beautiful brick and mortar emphasis, if you're going to be allowed to um, be, be extolled all these kind of honorific titles in, in culture and society, if you're going to be able to exist the way that we had existed for hundreds of years, you're going to have to look away from the, the kind of brutal and, and uh, um, uh, um, exploitative nature of, of uh, slavery. You're going to have to coexist and cooperate with this racial hierarchy, right? By and large, right? The world that we live in now, you have to, for all of us, anyone who's called Christian, have to grapple with a church going from the main line to, to the more marginal uh, um, members of, of the tree of Zion. You have to grapple with this. If those folks were wrong, right, and we believe in a heaven and hell, those, those ancestors who condoned, cooperated, and were complicit in the enslavement of other human beings, right, can you make peace with the fact that, yes, they might, in fact, be suffering in a fiery hell. When we grapple with the atrocities of which I'm, I'm, I'm enmeshing the Tulsa massacre within, right, of white supremacist terror, torture, but also a legal and political apparatus that made all of those things permissible and possible, right? If your folk called by your name condoned and co-signed that kind of behavior, thought, and state of being, they too might be in hell. They too were enacting satanic works in this world, right? In our day and time, right? Don't just throw this off on, on folks who can't defend themselves anymore, can't do anything about what they did, right? If we stand idly by and allow the corruption of, of, our, of our faith, the, the corruption of our de democratic, small d democratic uh, um, state of government, continue to make it so that this life and this world is unbearable, we have nobody else to blame but ourselves, right? We will be held accountable, right? If we believe what we say we believe. And now that might be the, the greatest question of all. Yeah, that's, I, let me just, we're, we're out of time and I'm, I have so many more questions and so much, I, I think frustration because I don't know. Yeah, I believe it's important for us to have these conversations. I absolutely believe that. I believe it's important for us to engage the history uh, in a very, specific way mm -hmm. and and I'm still struggling with how we get from from the wringing of the hands that I often see among people to the okay even if it's a little step to the steps they need to take for things to change I'm, I'm gonna transition us I put two things in the chat uh, if you're still here with us click on both of those link, links one of them is something that's happening. Oh, I uh, I think I put the same link in. No, yeah. Oh, One of them is happening tonight, which is with the Hispanic Summer Program Exchange. And Dr. Teresa, uh, Teresa Delgado will be lecturing tonight. And she will, in some ways, be addressing racism and ecology, just the way in which um, the way we treat the earth is, in fact, a way that we have treated people that have been minoritized by white supremacy and minoritized, he or she will probably be talking mostly about Latinx people, but not only, mm -hmm. because these, these issues are intersecting. So mm -hmm. I would really invite you to click on to that. And, and I know it says registration was closed two days ago, but they're taking registrations now. So I, I would invite you to those tonight. Um, the time is Eastern Standard. And then one other, which is Thursday a week from tomorrow, I will be in a conversation at lunchtime with Bishop uh, Jonathan Alvarado while we talk about uh, why he, as a Pentecostal, a Black Pentecostal, reject uh, the notion of being evangelical. 
and its connection to uh, our Wesleyan traditions and the racism that engendered these kinds of, of um, deadly alliances, he would say, deadly alliances. Mm -hmm. So the conversations, at least at MTSO, continue to try to unpack these very fraught things. And this is 100 years later. We didn't really talk about uh, as much the Black Lives Matter movement, but the but the the backlash is the same. The violence, the viciousness, the misrepresentation of what actually Black people are wanting or saying or doing is just phenomenal. It's a phenomenon that is distressing, yes, but but it's a wonder to behold. Mm. So as you say goodbye to us, Dr. Um, Floyd Thomas, would you like a last word uh, to this gathered group and to the people who will watch this later? I know several people who will watch it later. I, I Once again, I, I thank you all, uh, and I hope and pray that you, you didn't count it robbery to spend this time uh, in consideration and conversation about these topics. But I think the, the greatest... Uh, challenge and the greatest uh, um, prompt for change comes from that great practical theologian, uh, James. Uh, faith without works is dead, right? Don't just say with your mouth what you'd want the world to be. We actually have to work side by side, hand in hand with God to make the world the way that it, we want and need it to be. There's no time left for sitting on the sidelines, good people, right? We've had a hundred, in some cases, hundreds of years of waiting for folks to come around. We need to now make it so. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to those of you who joined us today and join us for our next events. Um, we're thankful for you, Dr. Floyd Thomas, and for all who attended these and who will watch them later. All right. Bye, everybody.